discussions about um, their dialogues program that they do in conjunction with the fair. Um, and SAIC. And SAIC because there's a partnership um, where um, Expo is going to deliver public dialogues throughout the course of the year, not only during the art fair, but throughout the, the rest of the year. So um, um, Trish reached out to us at Locust, and as many probably know but may not know, we're a not-for-profit organization in Miami. Um, we were founded by artists um, to be a place where we could ex you know, experiment, make new work, not have to worry about selling it, slash just push practice and, um, and, and, and make, make things. You should talk about the amazing shows you've had recently, especially in conjunction with Art Basel in Miami. Yes, so um, obviously down in Miami we throw a big blockbuster show out there during Basel. Um, <laughs> we actually, this, this past year, we're just celebrating 16 years of, you know, 501c3 um, and our programming has expanded dramatically, so in addition to exhibitions, it's also about talks and lectures. Um, two years ago, we had a major show with the Astro Gates, so it was just an awesome... Who's that? <laughs> Who's that guy? <laughs> That's how I, I <laughs> that brought him out because um, it, was, it was awesome to bridge that gap. That helped also to bridge the gap between Chicago and Miami. And, um, and he created this um, functioning pottery studio. No news to any of you guys, but, um, so, but for, it was really nice to share, to sh kind of share that to to the international scene too um and last year we worked with south african artist nicholas lobo um and he did uh an experimental opera in our space so we're just really let people the do ruben ochoa show the ruben ochoa show which was oh, the year prior yeah. to that was um called cores and cutouts where ruben ochoa um and i do have pictures of all this stuff and information about locusts if anyone wants to know but um Basically, Ruben Ochoa cored out five foot hunks of our floor and then suspended the, the concrete slab on top on a, on a big metal rod. And these and created about like 12 of these throughout the space. Um, and it was really amazing because, I mean, not only was it an amazing intervention into the space, but you could see these layers of um, geology, like the corals and all the, the different stones. Mm. So it was just, it was a wild installation. Thank God we moved spaces right after that, so we just bulldozed over the entire installation and just walked away. We didn't just walked away from the space, yeah. <laughs> so, um, and then to give like a very, very brief um, background to what the round table, the Locust round tables are, um, kind of in the same nature as like Locust as a place for experimentation. Um, these are open format discussions. Um, we founded them just a couple of years ago um, as just a way um, just to talk about stuff that we all were finding interesting, like it's kind of very much about like, you know, what do you, what do you want to talk about and how do you want to talk about it? And we've been doing that for the past couple of years, um, just kind of, they've taken the form of like sort of performative lectures and spirit readings and more straight up like sort of rigorous theory-based lectures and um, something that John and I, and John is so kind to have um, agreed to do this, um, we'll do kind of the format for this one, as you'll see, is like we're going to kind of sketch out an idea that John has been interested in um, and and work through it and and what will sort of happen is that we'll kind of turn it over and just like start talking about it um, and feel like literally you know we're, we're going to kind of moderate through and like talk talk about this in a, in a wider sense between all of us um, or you can decide that you don't want to participate but it's kind of what the nature of these things, <coughs> these things is. so don't think about it as like you know, a formal panel that's sort of not, you know, what, what, what this is. So, um, <clears throat> so without any further ado, um, I will, um, so pleased to introduce John as many of you are like, obviously it seems like he has a lot of fans in the room. So, um, no way. And, um, oh. so like, oh, I don't want to, keep this but, um, as many of you guys know, John is a photographer and an educator, born in Buffalo uh, and now based in Chicago. Um, graduated uh, with an MFA uh, from the School of Art Institute of Chicago, is that right? And, um, and you know, keeps up a rigorous teaching and, and, and produces work. Um, and shows next door. Shows next door. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so, uh, John also, I, got, I met John through um, um, Michael John Gallery in Miami, who many of you probably know Michael Radzowitz, who was Chicago-based and now lives in Miami and runs and operates Michael John Gallery, um, which actually is going to be in Basel this year, so in the main yeah, fair. So props to that. Um, it's a features a lot of other Chicago artists. Well. Yeah, and Michael, yeah, so Michael has shown a lot of Chicago people, so there's kind of like a nice, a nice thing happening there. Um, but that's how I met John and got really interested in these beautiful pieces that he showed um, at the gallery a couple months ago. 
and we just struck up a conversation. And then when I was thinking about bringing the round tables here, I was like, John. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah you called me. I, I was in New York visiting a friend of mine. And uh, I was I just finished seeing two shows that were really, I, I was very struck by in terms of well, what we're going to talk about. But it's kind of serendipitous. You called me, asked me to do this. I'm like, shit, what am I going to talk about? <laughs> and my friend Phil's like, dude, talk about surface. Baron? Yeah, in that voice. And I was like, yes, <laughs> that's what I'm going to do. Um, so, yeah, yeah. And the other thing I'd just like to say, too, is, uh, you know, this is an idea or a concern, I think, that's preoccupied me, but uh, very much fed by, uh, you know, a few uh, people in this room, either through, uh, you know, dialogue, direct dialogue, or, you know, I mean, Shane, we've been following each other's work over the years, so, um, yeah, it's, it's, I'm glad that uh, the people who are here are here, I guess, because... Um, there, there are probably a few other people in Chicago I, I would love to have here tonight, but yeah, I, I think it's, uh, I just want to emphasize this is not like uh, an original idea by any stretch of the, the imagination. We were kind of overemphasizing that today when we were talking at the MCA, like this is not a new idea, but I, I think it is one that uh, changes, it evolves, and if anything, I, I, I always, I, I think it's a reflection of what's happening uh, in art and culture at, at any given moment in time. So for me, this is, uh, yes, a conversation that's been had over and over again was uh, really the the main argument surrounding modernism and where we are, you know, how we got to where we are today. Uh, and I, I'd like to include those kind of ideas, but um, yeah, I, I what I'd like to have happen today, I mean, I really don't have a thesis or maybe I have a thesis, but I'm not going to share it, maybe it sounds crazy to people right now, but uh, I'm, I'm more interested in just hearing what people have to say about uh, what, what we're going to look at and just, um, yeah, I'm kind of looking at this as kind of an ongoing continuum, I guess, more than anything else. And I just got very tangential, I don't know if I cut you off. But no, what, not okay. at all, not at all, so. Well, we can start, I guess, yeah, right? Yeah. Okay. All right, well. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, surface, so I, I have a couple points that I, I would like to uh, have the conversation revolve around, and they, they might seem very overly simplified, maybe for a few of you, but uh, but I, I think oftentimes, you know, the simplest statements kind of still require the most unpacking, in a way, and that's kind of... Again, you know, why, why I, I kind of continue to return to this again and again, kind of like a meditation. Um, but we're, we're looking at, uh, we, mentioned, we mentioned Morris Lewis in the press release, and I'm like, the more I started thinking about this, the less I was thinking about Morris Lewis. I think I just threw that out to you, because I just seen Adam Henry's show, and I, I immediately, Morris Lewis came to mind. Mm -hmm. Um, but this is uh, this is a, a detail of Lewis, and I guess in in a sense, um, there's something peculiar about his uh, later paintings that I think, uh, in a way, from an experiential kind of position, expand outward into a photographic uh, world or a photographic universe. And and it's uh, this in particular. I, I feel like if you've been in the dark room, you've made a photogram, or if you you photograph something where light overexposure or light bleeds around the form or the, the line that delineates a form. Uh, there, there are aspects of Lewis's paintings that, uh, for me, start, start to feel uh, more like, we, we were saying, additive color space than subtractive color space, meaning more about a mixture of light than a mixture of pigment. And, uh, and yeah, so I, and I, I guess, the funny thing is, too, we were at the MCA today, and I was like, oh, there's the Wolfgang Tillman's book. I remember Lane Raleigh had written something about the abstraction. And, of course, I was like, I, I said to you, I'm like, oh, I should have, you know, I should have had this book. I should have read this. Um, well, it was all kind of right there. Yeah, but like, he, was um, like yeah, which was curious, he brought up Lewis in, in relationship to those, that I, uh, to the photographs. Anyway, um, so my points here... <clears throat> 
Uh, this is very open-ended here right now. Uh, but here's the main things I, I'd like to kind of establish maybe as something for us to revolve the conversation around, which is, first of all, that uh, when we talk about surface, in fact, here, this is my diagram of depth, I call it. But, and this is by no means meant to be read in a literal way, but when we talk about surface, uh, we're really talking about the relationship between surface and what is underneath the surface. That, uh, And again, this might be a very uh, obvious thing for, for some of you, and, and yes, it is an obvious thing, maybe. But again, I, I think it's, it's important to, uh, to keep that in mind in relationship to uh, maybe how how a surface functions or or what it's doing or how it maybe it's not functioning. And the other thing I'd like to maybe add to that is that I'm not necessarily talking about uh, perspectival distance or uh, even a distance that uh, we might solely associate with human observation. Uh, in parentheses, maybe the camera, right? Because I I think of the camera, the optics of the camera. Uh, being just basically a simulation of, uh, of how it is that we, we kind of interact with the world on a, on a visual level. Uh, there, there is that part, but I, I also would like to uh, maybe throw it out there and get a little weird and you know, suggest that we're also talking about, I mean, it's really uh, categories of, of, of pluralities here, that it, it, it's very much about a psychological space, maybe a quantum space, something that defies uh, you know, uh, normal notions of distance and even time, uh, you know, something non-linear. So there's a lot of ways that we can think about this, I, I believe. Um, yeah, so that, that's one thing I'd like to kind of establish. And the other thing, of course, is that, <coughs> excuse me, the other thing, of course, is cough, cough, uh, is that uh, images are ubiquitous, that they're everywhere. And um, that, and there's been a lot, of course, written about this, but that we are we are uh, constantly surrounded by photographs. I mean, there, a lot has been written on this, of course, the idea of the simulacrum and uh, simulation itself, which was pretty much the topic of my show in Miami. Uh, but uh, sorry, I just had a brain fart. Um, no, that, uh, that, that basically we're, we're talking about uh, a kind of reality that photographs have created. And I, I have an, an idea that, and, and many have before me, this is not original, that somehow uh, because, because photographs are so ubiquitous that we are in a sense now uh, living inside of like a photographic universe. I, and I just spent the last week reading uh, Flusor, which... Uh, Adam has been urging me and, and my friend Jeremy Boland and I realized I had read the image in the apparatus in grad school, just did not know who wrote it. But I, 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 I read that and uh, yeah, and, and this is the same thing that uh, is the basis of ideas around simulation and uh, maybe Walter Benjamin's uh, The Aura uh, versus you know the removal of Aura. So somehow we are inside of uh, a scenario where I think we're looking at reality uh, as though uh, we are kind of, we are the photographs. And, you know, all one needs to do is open up, uh, you know, this month's issue of Vogue or Elle magazine and, uh, you know, you can see, you know, exactly what what it is that we are, we are trying to be here, you know, at least uh, uh, from a, a gender standpoint. Um, anyway, so that that's another... That's another thing that I, I'd like to kind of throw out there. And I guess uh, that that being said, I suppose in a nutshell I could say that something I feel like I've noticed is that there's been a lot of painting lately that, that uses the grammar and qualities of, of photography, maybe the ingredients for uh, the ideas around photography and it's, it's kind of reapplied back onto the canvas, not in ways I, I don't think that we've really seen before. Um, and the other, the other thing, of course, is, which is certainly my own work, is that uh, what happens in my own work is that, you know, a lot of photography is trying to be like painting. And uh, it reminds me, too, of, of this idea that Flusur talks about, which is the program. Uh, that, you know, photography, we are really locked into a certain 
way of expressing uh, a photographic uh, reality in that you know a lot of photography comes in this pre-packaged kind of uh, finite system that we call inkjet photography or you know whatever it was straight photography commercial mm -hmm. photography and that uh, that that is kind of where, where we find ourselves locked into so that's I guess mm -hmm. basically just say one thing that's yeah like, um, please can you use examples of these painters that yeah you that's that's coming okay, up next sorry. yeah here we go I'm preempting you. Mm. so yeah when Amanda called me I was literally uh, let me see if I missed anything I did but whatever uh, all right, well, you also wanted me to talk about my own work a little bit. Can I do that quickly, and then we'll get to the painters? Sorry. I should have practiced this in front of a mirror. I didn't. <laughs> um, but where surface, I, I feel like why, why I started thinking about this in terms of my own subjective experience and, and my own uh, development as an artist, uh, you know, surface, uh, for a long time, I, I was working in a very uh, maybe traditional photographic mode, and then I was making 4 by 5 scanning them on the Emicon, printing them on Epson Premium Luster, throwing them in a white frame, and that was the end of the day, you know. And sometime around, you know, 2009, I, I started to really be, like, strangely more concerned with things like paper surface and framing choice and things, you know, and I, I think that's, and I, I certainly wasn't alone. I think this was happening uh, all around us. But, uh, yeah, I mean, at, at the time I was still working very, very much on, on this older project that some of you guys might be familiar with. This is uh, uh, from 2009, but this was a very important site for me and I think uh, an important kind of useful metaphor for thinking about surface here. Uh, this was a, a naturally occurring phenomenon in western New York where I'm from. Uh, you know, I, my old spiel used to be, you know, I'm the son, son of a geologist, and my, my father uh, really served as a kind of a research assistant for me for a long time. And he would basically point me in the direction of these cool places in western New York, and there was a lot of other things happening here. But in terms of surface, uh, I, I like this as a metaphor in that this is a methane gas spring that naturally exists uh, within the shale bedrock in western New York. And it's actually not an uncommon phenomenon, uh, but it's very strange that this particular one happens to be located where there's also a waterfall. Uh, but in terms of what we're talking about, I, I, I like this image or this idea uh, because here we see evidence of something on the surface that points to uh, something far more abstract and obscure and difficult uh, that, that exists under the surface. And whether or not we have access to it, in fact, we don't, uh, but we can only kind of imagine and, and kind of theorize about uh, what happens there. So uh, if, if that makes sense, I, I think this is this place, uh, you know, was a really important to me for uh, a long time in, in terms of, you know, most of the conceptual drivers in my work. Uh, but after that, I kind of just started to... It, the, the landscape thing kind of dwindled off. And this was literally the last uh, landscape picture I ever made. Uh, and it's probably the most like a painting of any straight photograph that I've ever made in terms of um, the type of space it describes. It has lens flare, which is, this is a straight photograph, by the way, wow. taken with a Schneider 240 millimeter lens, made in the 1960s, great lens. Um, and uh, it's a straight photograph. It's, it's at uh, Makokata, Iowa, uh, the caves there. And I went there in early spring. I just photographed, <coughs> excuse me, through this ice sheet, this ice curtain. And there are some other things that I think are of importance, like the little floaties. There was like dust on the lens, which you can see. I don't know if I had a laser pointer. I'll use this, this thing here. So there are some like kind of optical impurities that exist that uh, you know point towards a observation, human observation. But I, I felt that this this was accomplishing something different, and I think these concerns kind of went back quite a ways with me. Uh, this black sun photograph I, I made in 2005, and it's an in-camera solarization. But um, again, that 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 point of the sun 
Uh, we don't, you know, this, I'm not suggesting about the surface of the sun, but there's something happening here in pictorial space where the the trans the 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 surface of the photograph is being pierced or punctured for me. Um, kind of like a Fontana, maybe. Uh, and the surface just kind of started to become... And I, I made this, what I told Amanda, was more or less a schizophrenic break uh, when I started the antitypes. But, uh, you know, I, I wanted... I was done with the landscape. So I, the work started to get much more uh, material-based. And dealing with the idea of, uh, this, you know, the, the presence of the object on the wall that someone had to navigate around. But for me, I, I can't, myself, I cannot get away from the idea of a, an observed image that somehow, uh, even though we're talking about something completely virtual, like the piece on the left, this is an installation picture from Miami, that uh, it still, for me, uh, describes a very... Uh, real, you know, hyper real space. So that that's kind of uh, where I I am, I guess. And so when Amanda called me, here it is. Hey John, before you get too far. Yeah, yeah. Like the, if you go back to that image. Yeah. I'm just wondering how many people have seen work of yours where there's the sculptural. The two by four. This is the only place. I'm not sure yeah. anybody's. How many people have seen this show? Yeah, no oh, one. This is very new. Looking. Because I feel like this is very new. <laughs> this is the part that I'm interested in making sure that we all see. Yeah. Yeah, and that's something. Yeah. I, and uh, if if uh, if you can get to it, if the door is unlocked, uh, there, I have a, a piece up right now in Chicago at the studio building where I work. Uh, Alex Tan, south of the tracks. Maybe some of you have heard of this venue, south of the tracks. Um, yeah, and so that that was something that I was kind of uh, was haunting me maybe for a couple of years, and I thought, son of a bitch, I just have to do this. And uh, it was around the time that I started working with the linen and fabric; it, it just kind of made sense. So I look at it as a it, it is about surface. It's a it's an alternate site for surface. There it, there's a hole in the wall. I mean, it's not like a rough hole. It's you know, it's a built-out space. It's a, it's kind of a rough space. I mean, I, it's kind of part of the charm of that gallery. And uh, so I basically studded in the wall uh, as though, you know, we were going to make it a complete white cube. But the surface of the 2 by 4s is coated with cyanotype linen. I developed a technique to basically glue on uh, fabric. And uh, so it exists as kind of this virtual wall. A That's wall, like the and it's a frame. Yeah. yeah that, so I, I basically looked at it as literally, literally frame is is like you know like framing edge. Uh, so an alt in this show, I mean, was basically about the notion of a window. Um, you know, and kind of even considering the sun is. Yeah, that's, those are Venetian blinds, and uh, the, there are more of those coming. I, I made two in Miami. I'm working on some others now, um, and they're. Uh, you know, they, they, I think when I get through the rest of the slides, maybe we, if you, if you want to come back to that, because uh, I, I think it very much has to do with uh, maybe certain uh, aspects of surface that I'm, I'm thinking about. And I, I almost, for me, that, that piece is a topical piece in that I, uh, it seems very relevant to our time. I mean, in, in a literal way, uh, you know, my, my dad is like, is that about global warming? And I'm like, well, it's not not about global warming. I mean, uh, so yeah, I it could be, but it, it's it's something is is amiss, and uh, it has to do with hallucination, maybe, or or a distortion that is uh, extreme, maybe. Um, uh, I don't know. Any? Yeah. Should I just move on? I was just pointing it out because I feel like. What you've shown us so far has been a transition out of image making to object making. You know, mm -hmm. I feel like. Well, <clears throat> yeah. You know, like not that you're not still making images, but you're definitely more of an object. Definitely. You yeah. know, more of an object <clears throat> practice. It's, more of a, it's a larger part of your practice. Yeah. Like an object where it's just making images. And, yeah. and so I feel like the wall piece is definitely the most object like thing you've done, or it's a true sort of. Three-dimensional intervention can be viewed from all 
Malta, it's, it's an object, you know? Yeah. Maybe it's an image, maybe it's an object, maybe it's none of, maybe it's all of those things. I don't know, I'm not sure it's how interesting that argument is, or if there is even but an argument. But also, there's a clear games. trajectory of going from there, totally. from left to there. Like, totally. that makes total sense yeah. to me, right. especially, so, like, knowing the history of his work. Yeah, so I just feel like it's something that like could be missed if you if you don't know where. Well, I didn't want to talk. Yeah, I th I felt. Well, I wanted to give. A, yeah, I I. I mean, if I could talk about. It. It oh yeah, I figured I'd leave it out today because I'm like, uh, it's not really about what we're talking about, but it kind of is. I also didn't want to. Well, this has so many sides. Yeah, yeah. I I just I didn't want it to make it all about me too. I was like, I really wanted to talk about the other artists, but. Uh, interested in your work. No, well, I, okay, well, uh, I mean, it's still an idea that's very much in the early stages of development. I'll say that. I just think it's worth, I just want to make sure you get sort of lost in the shot. Sure. Well, I'll tell you one thing I will, I mean, and that, that is a very new gesture, and actually, uh, when I went down to Miami, my, the gesture was much more ambitious, and I started to put things together, and Michael was like, no, dude. I'm like, you're right. You're right. It's too much. <laughs> Uh, so it is a small space. I mean, I when I agreed to do the show, I thought we were talking about a room this size. Really, we're talking about a room maybe half of the size. Yeah, it's just a yeah. vertical, like dramatic. Yeah. Vertical. So I'll tell. So the only thing I will say is that I one thing I really feel is important after I, I've made two of those now, and I'm it's very much in the early stages of, uh, you know, coming into being. So I, I really I I can't exactly explain to you what it is that I'm doing with that completely, and I because I, I think it's going to change and evolve. But I, I can tell you one thing is that I, it's not an art booth piece. I think it's, for me, it's, it's very important that it somehow integrates into the space where it's installed uh, as a way to supplement the wall works. Is kind of how I'm, I'm thinking about it. And, um, and I, I think that's all I can really say about it at this point. But I, I think everything you're saying is, is totally on point about uh, there being all these uh, multiple alternate surfaces that are, you know, if, if you really wanted to think of it in, the, in that way, that there are multiple surfaces or multiple vantage points that are, you know, it's impossible to reconcile, uh, you know, through one, one viewing uh, point. Yeah. That you have to kind of uh, circle the piece and, and look at it from different directions. And there are images on the studs. They're, they're contact printed. Uh, in fact, it's the same, I mean, I should have just put more slides of my work in here, but they're the same motif uh, as the, as are on the, these pieces, which I'm calling equivalents, uh, kind of as, as a nod to Stieglitz's cloud photographs, uh, you know, kind of the, the first uh, acknowledged abstract, uh, you know, set of photographs. But let me, look, we can come back to this, because let's talk... Because I, f honestly, I find this more interesting. <laughs> um, or does anyone want to keep talking about no, that? No, I wasn't really wanting to talk too much about it. That's why I didn't make sure everybody saw it. Yeah, I know. Yeah, well, there'll be other artist like talks. I thought it was a raptor. I feel like, like, I didn't know that. I feel like it might be important to come back to Oh, yeah, yeah. And maybe this could be like a way for us to come back to it and actually help you figure some stuff out. If you want to do that, let's yeah. do it. Okay, let's take, yeah. We'll, yeah. I think it's interesting you mentioned hallucination because... Mm. Yeah. It becomes very powerful when it's three dimensional. Like if you think of a surface as hallucinatory. Yeah. Yeah. Like Trump Royale. Yeah. 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 It yeah. becomes an object that's kind of like no longer a game. Yeah. It's no longer a game? In a way. Yeah. Like it's it's buying for a different. Yeah. Yeah. I see what you're quality. saying. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I'm interested in, to hear you talk about hallucination. Actually. Yeah. No, I will. I'll get there. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess it is kind of. Uh, uh, is it Trump? I don't even know how to say it. Trump. 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 Loy. Trump. Loy. Trump. Loy. Uh, yeah, I guess maybe it it does have kind of that thing happening. But uh, again, it, it's if you really look at those surfaces, they feel very deep. I mean, I'm not saying conceptually deep, but I'm saying uh, uh, experientially, they they feel like uh, it's surprising how how far back in space those the uh, surfaces seem to go. But let's let's just we'll come back to that because <laughs> if I don't talk about Adam Henry, I'm not going to be able to tell him I talked about him. So where is this? This is in New York. So this is basically uh, why this talk happened and, and why I, it kind of lit a fire under me to to, to think about this stuff. Because um, when when uh, Amanda called me, I you know, like I said, I, I was literally in New York visiting a friend who's 
Philip Vanderheiden, who's, who's work in a way should be included in this presentation today, but I I've, 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 I've praised him enough. Yeah, he's, he doesn't eat anymore. Uh, but what struck me about these paintings, uh, first of all, uh, their surfaces, I mean, not, uh, felt very much like glossy luster photographs. This is a Joe Scheftel gallery in Lower East Side, um, right across the street from Untitled, I think. <clears throat> yeah, small, small. He only has about four artists on his roster. Uh, but I was kind of floored. Uh, and by the way, the, both these uh, shows that I'm going to show you that I saw in New York don't translate that well uh, in photographs, strangely enough. But uh, these, these, so basically what he did, uh, and I, I had a chance to talk to him on the phone too, because I was really kind of intrigued and obsessed with what he was thinking about. And I, uh, just looking at his older work too, I, I feel like these paintings are like a, a crazy breakthrough for him, and I, I can't speak for him, but uh, these are by far, I think, uh, the most fascinating uh, works that he's ever made. It's so this is, and he had to tell me. So he's something that doesn't happen very often in painting. He's using uh, very innovative, very new materials. Um, I mean. Whoops. Well, no, well, uh, but they're like these weird oil polymers that take like up to 12 hours to dry. And he's spraying them, obviously, but what kind of struck me about these, first of all, the surface read very much like a photograph, uh, just slick, smooth, uh, surfaceless, if that's a word. Uh, and uh, he's, he's setting up a scenario kind of like one would do if you had to, say, dodge, make 25 copies of the same negative in the darkroom that had a very rigorous dodging and burning kind of sequence that had to happen, right? I mean, have we, I don't know if anyone in photo students know yeah, Shane is probably the only person. Yes, oh, Leo, there you go. Um, otherwise, we're all learning foundations and Lightroom and Camera Raw right now. But uh, in the olden days, uh, when I was in college, yeah, if I wanted 25 copies of the same photograph and I had to add 10 seconds here, remove three seconds here, there was a, a kind of schematic you would have to draw up. And that's precisely how he achieved these paintings. Is he, uh, it was based on time and position. So the airbrush here in this position for three seconds at this setting and so on and so forth. So in the way that these colors are mixing, for me, again, is, is more in line with... Uh, how light mixes. Uh, they, these feel very additive. And I, I kind of was like, aha, you know, he, right when I was about to use the phrase chromatic aberration, he brought it up. And so. Chromatic aberration. Chromatic aberration, it's which is. If you ever teach a foundations class in photography, you're like, God damn it, apply chromatic aberration, please. Oh. Yeah, so. I'm just getting another beer here. Uh, so, yeah, I, I felt like looking at these paintings in a way was kind of like looking at a compromised like lens system into wherever uh, you're looking. And uh, these, these paintings feel very deep to me. I mean, I'm not saying deep like deep, dude. I'm saying when, I'm, uh, when I was in front of these, they felt as though they were going back 500 feet in space. And I think it has a lot to do with the interaction of hue and color, but... Also, that surface that was just totally mesmerizing to me, um, and scale. the scale, yeah, the and too. yeah, the scale, yeah, and the you scale. were like you couldn't get away from them. This this gallery is maybe fourteen feet across. Uh, it says in the, I think they were I don't know five by six feet. Something like that. They're big. I mean, you know, they're they're they're, they're large. Generally. And they're rectangular. Yeah. He also, yeah, sorry. The gallery's so narrow that when you're in front of one, yeah. you, can't, you can't back up far enough to see the whole thing, you know? It worked. What's the name of the gallery again? Joe Scheftel. It says it on the courtesy of Joe Scheftel. So are they, are they um, you're describing the process, um, so each one is um, Here, I'll go. Seeming, seemingly same. the same, but not, see? Okay, and subtle shift, okay. Because I, I mean, I, I, have you ever thought of Anne Craven's 
paintings as photographs. Oh yeah, no, could, I mean, but I mean, yeah, I yeah, but the way that yeah. the way there's this like seemingly, you know, they, they're they're definitely not the same yeah. painting every time. But she paints in this reality, you know, in yeah. about five six years ago. I was talking to this, you know, I can't look at her work photographically in a similar yeah. way. Um, yeah, it doesn't look. It does. It doesn't necessarily pursue that sort of perfection yeah. that a lot of um, you know yeah. back when we were in school was like. Yeah, like making a perfect print or making a perfect, you know. Um, yeah, well, modes of production maybe. Absolutely. That's like that. The mode of production is very photo. And actually, her moon paintings yeah. look like photographs. Absolutely. Those are the favorite, my favorite things she ever did, and yeah. she she made those. I mean, those are very small shows she did. Well, but yeah, yeah, and the physical difference between the paintings really also relates to photography in another way, which is that it's imperceptible in real life mm. because you're too close to it to see, but only uh. perceptible when you're flipping between. Photographs. Yeah. I, mean, I don't think that you'd be able to see the difference in the whole. No. As in fact, you could. Yeah. yeah, that's right. In fact, when I was there, I was like, I was really blown away because, like, how yeah. do you do this? Yeah, and then you realize it's all lying. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like everything. <laughs> anyway, but I, I yeah, thought of these. Terrible lie. Yeah. <laughs> but I, 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 I thought back, and that's why when Amanda called me, I was like, yeah, and like Morris Lewis and stuff. Because I just seen these, I just saw these paintings, and I, I couldn't help to be reminded of, of these, in a way, uh, in in that I again I, I feel like they they feel uh, that almost looks like chromatic aberration on the right hand side that these paintings start to I think veer away from what uh, Greenberg and Fried you know said that modernist painting was all about, which was rejection of subject matter in favor of material surface and and the kind of closed system that a painting creates and presents simultaneously, for me, these, these start to veer you know, towards that photographic universe in a way. And I, I, I wonder, I mean, these were made late, late in, in modernity. Uh, you know, when, when we look at uh, the other achievements that happened with Pollock, and, and you know, these, he, he kind of came to the game late in life, is what I guess I'm saying. And I, I wonder if... Uh, you know, these being his mature works, if, if that has anything to do uh, with a kind of premonition that uh, where painting would would kind of end up. So that, and these are some earlier works. He just, uh, he was like, yeah, man, I think about it. I've been thinking about photography forever. And so he's like, I'll send you some other things that I think you'll be interested in. And no, that's like anyone else. That's just my voice to anyone. Uh, yeah, he actually, you know, who did he bring up? Uh, yeah, he did, but then he, he said, well, you know, he studied with Mel Bachner at, at Yale. Yeah, and he actually, who did he, he brought up someone that was like, really? I'm like, okay. Alfred Jensen. Yeah, no, I mean, but I'm like, yeah, I love Alfred Jensen, but I don't see a lot of Alfred Jensen mojo in these paintings. Um, but, yeah. But anyway, these are about exposure. So the other show that I saw, and this is both of these shows, by the way, are, are still up. Uh, Sam Moyer, who's uh, a female painter, and she's showing at Rachel Ufner, Ufner Gallery right now. Ufner. Ufner, Ufner, Ufner. <laughs> Sorry. Anyway, um, much like what's happening in Adam's paintings, I feel like, first of all. It's a narrow gallery. Yeah. They all are over there. But the ingredients of this exhibition seem to be really pointing again towards a lot of uh, ingredients and grammars around photography. In fact, the, the main space, the biggest space in the, in the, in the gallery was uh, housed this piece, which when I first walked in, I was like, this is bullshit. But then I was like, no, this is really good. <laughs> this is really good. Those are the best pieces. What yeah. you initially eat them? What is this? This is Sam Moyer. And she, uh, I don't know a lot about her. And I, again, I, I, but I did, I did look into her after I saw the show, and I, I realized I think this is also some uh, really breakthrough work for her. Uh, and, and the press release even alludes to a lot of uh, like mechanisms in photography. But this, this piece in the main space is very much about that slab as the subject, and it's just lit in this unbelievably pleasant and ethereal and uh, 
uh, kind of sublime way. I mean, I, I almost I started to feel really anxious and frightened for I don't know why, but uh, it was it was kind of startling to me. And uh, but use pretty simple kind of theatrical means to achieve it. Uh, and this 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 is all about light striking a subject. But anyway, these other pieces, which I feel were very similar to, to Adams in, in the sense that they, they, they reproduce horribly, by the way. They're very flat in a photograph when you're in front of them. It's a different story. Uh, but they're framed with like Nielsen brass frames and uh, they're all glazed. They're, they're glass that uh, we're looking at ink on glass that's kind of settled in you know, what Jeff Wall might call a complex natural form. Um, you know, maybe, but uh, but there is a very there's a micro distance between uh, you know the, the the plane of the glass and then these uh, kind of low contrast drawings behind the glass. But I'll tell you, man, uh, these go back so far in space when you're standing in front of them, and, they, and I, again, they don't really translate well at all here. Uh, but you know. Two, two very different methodologies uh, at work here in terms of how these painters achieved this space, but uh, I think in many ways uh, both shows accomplished a lot of the same thing. And th these, these for me weren't nearly as moving, uh, but they were in the upstairs gallery, and I, I think they're much more about the objecthood and uh, a more sculptural kind of presence. So, um, and may I say, I think you touched on it. An art star, for sure. I mean, What's that? To the market, Sam Moyer. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, to the market, anyway. Yeah. You're going to have to... Those will be on auction. Oh, the sure they will. Yeah, market. yeah. And, I, you know, that's... And that doesn't matter, but... Well, that, that is a, that's something that we talked about, Amanda and I, uh, in the MCA, that uh, surface... Uh, you know, surface is also... I mean, I just... Let me refer to my notes here. I, th I think another yeah, another critique of, of surface and depth might have to do with uh, an overemphasis of surface alone uh, can, can be framed to be about materiality or superficiality or capitalist commodification. And that's exactly what that uh, enter cellulator stage left uh, or and ornament, you know. Um, and that that's uh, I think that is the that's the question too. I think is. Uh, Anyway, I, this is Anthony Pearson's work. I, I, could, I could open this up. We could, we could keep telling, talking. Six o'clock, what should we do? Keep going. Keep going. Pearson. Um, well, I thought about these. I, I'm, I'm kind of uh, unresolved about these. They're beautiful. They're absolutely stunning, and they'll, they'll probably be worth twice what they're worth today. Um, seriously? Um, but uh, uh, yeah, that there, there's very much, uh, I think, an emphasis, maybe an overemphasis on surface, but somehow they also uh, kind of sneak back and they, they feel uh, a lot deeper uh, than, than they are. So I, this again, just another maybe example. I mean, this is using very much uh, the trick of perspective. Uh, but there's there's something about these fields. And then uh, some other thoughts I had. Uh, just David Hammond's show at L and M in New York two years ago. Uh, you know, walking on North Avenue the other day, I saw this, <laughs> and I, I I really think that's where he got it. I mean, that's that's the space he's describing. I, I think these these paintings, if we took the tarps off, they're intentionally hokey. Uh, I mean, I think we we'd probably see, you know kind of a, a, a bad Sam Francis under there. Um, and I, I think that that's one of the levels he's, he's asking us to consider. I, I think in terms of surface and depth, uh, these, these are maybe some of the most uh, profound examples, I think, in, in terms of, uh, you know, Hammonds always has this crazy ability of being on point uh, at a very precise moment in time, culturally, socially, economically. And this is just, and, and, and they, sometimes his paintings don't age well, or his works don't age well, for me anyway. And I think that's probably one of the great things about what he does is, uh, 
he's, he is so kind of sensitive to, to the times we live in. But I, I imagine, you know, walking around New York, there's a lot of renovation, gentrification going on continuously. It's, it's an ongoing continuum there. I, but these are also sites where people who don't have homes uh, occupy. But how would you compare these to the Robert Overby pieces that, you know, the big, the big pieces he did on the side of buildings and the casts of... These these are a horror. These are there's a horror here. I think I, I that aren't in those Robert Yeah, I mean I think first of all David Hammonds made these, so uh, you know immediately they need to be framed uh, in in terms of considering you know his his practice. Uh, but they they are about I think more of a social Is space. A, a dirtier, more interesting version of those Overby pieces, maybe. Yeah, I mean, I see these being, well, first of all, the site, too, where this is shown, these were shown, was a, a renovated, there's a history to this building. I don't know if maybe someone in here knows. Uh, but I know there's, like, you know, if you if you go to any building or brownstone in New York that has that kind of, you know, crown molding, black people were not the first inhabitants of those buildings. I mean, you know, th- those those were made by the, ty- you know, the shipping and, Industry tycoons in New York, and I, that's basically where this this gallery exists. The same people that can afford to buy it now. Rashid Johnson, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, oh right, no. Oh. no, I mean, no, I'm just saying Rashid has a house that uh, I've been in that uh, has like the face of the person who built the house embedded in the crown molding, and it's like this white dude with a beard. It's like a cat ship captain. It's kind of amazing. Yeah, yeah, well, anyway. Uh, but uh, these, for me, uh, I mean, I, this, this almost feels like it could be a, a clan hood. Um, there, I think there are a lot of associations going on with these pieces, but I think the underlying thing is uh, what is underneath these, at the end of the day, probably isn't worth lifting the veil to see. Um, and I, I think, you know, a lot of the color palette's kind of hokey. There's like some, you know... Joan Mitchell type brushwork. I mean, you know, maybe I like Joan Mitchell. She's fine. She's a good painter. Don't diss on Joan Mitchell. I'm sorry, but you know what I mean. Or maybe you don't. But um, <laughs> let's keep going. That got uncomfortable. Uh, Ela Lacery. Uh, a lot of talk about this guy, um, and I, I would I would argue that maybe uh, you know I mean a couple. Of, Christopher Williams comes to mind, uh, Roe Etheridge, you know, but uh, Lacery seems to be caught in a weird kind of, a very strange space. In fact, uh, he insists that they're, you know, the subjects are, are not important at all, um, that, you know, it's, it's not about the subject at all, that it's, it's about the form of an image in a frame and you can almost, uh, when I look at this, you know, you walk into a lacery show and it, it, it immediately kind of strikes you as being very sculptural. I'm not sure how deep this goes. Um, and I, I think I'm, I'm ultimately still very skeptical of whatever it is his priorities seem to be. It's, it's kind of unclear to me when I, when I read interviews with him um, whether, whether this is a critique or an indulgence in, in uh, these type of cultural tendencies. But I, I think one thing that's really important to note in his pieces is that they do not go back very far in space. That they, uh, and I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not suggesting that the associations are shallow space equals shallow concept, but, uh, and I, I'm not suggesting that at all with him. But there's something uh, happening here, and, and maybe that's, I, I would be interested in what, what folks in the audience here have to say, especially photo people. Um, because I, I think he is—he's certainly using a lot of the same vocabulary that Christopher Williams is using, uh, and, it, and it's the vocabulary that we all, you know, ultimately rule our lives by, whether we want to admit that or not. But uh, yeah, I, I think there, it's very telling that these are, in fact, this just feels like the cats were like shoved in the frame, and you know, it almost feels as though it goes back only four inches or so. He uses a really talented and expensive framer. 
Really? I bet. Yeah, his frame. Actually, I've seen some of his frames, the older ones. It looks like he, he like spray painted Joanne Fabrics frames, but I think now, <laughs> I think now he's probably, I think he can afford, yeah. And I think it's, it, and he, none of these, uh, they're all 11 by 14, very modest sizes, but you know, he makes these sculptural works that feel like cabinets. You, you, you never quite have access to what the inner workings of, of the, uh, the piece suggests that it's about. And, uh, you know, this this kind of reminds me of uh, you know, uh, Jeremy. I, I read I read that whole Flusser book this week, but the black box uh, and the apparatus and and maybe that's what uh, is at play here. Is that these are these are completely uh, blatant expressions of the photographic program, uh, where uh, you know where Williams is is maybe more of an obvious critique of of this. Scenario: These these don't feel as urgent. Uh, there aren't there isn't the kind of malaise or nausea. Uh, maybe it, I don't know. Depending on who you are, I guess these could feel gross or not gross. But uh, and then some historical examples: Jan de Bay. I uh, I've never seen any of these pieces in person, but uh, they were certainly. Uh, Inspiration for the equivalence in that I I love the the juxtaposition between the photographic kind of uh, singularity or you know in the middle of the, the window or whatever the uh, photographic moment that opens up to something else but uh, that they're mounted on canvas and they exist on uh, these monochromatic uh, canvases that have quite a bit of subtle brushwork so they almost they're windows that almost seem to be floating in an ether. You know, simultaneously mounted on a wall, but uh, there's a lot of back and forth between between figure ground. Uh, and some other thoughts. Maria Robinson. Uh, Adam Adam told me, well, you should look at Maria Robertson. And you, some of you guys might remember she used to show at Gray Gray and Guild Gray and Guild and Gray Skull in New York gallery that went under in 2007 basically but she she did an awesome show there of male nudes that were like color solar uh color solarized color photographs um and now she's kind of doing these weird uh liquid type you know liquid intelligence type pieces and i it, these are not unlike the kinds of forms that are showing up on my uh sculpture on the two by fours um no bleach. I think it's a Curtis Mann type situation. I think she's, you know, RA4 chemistry outside of the processor, and uh, I think, yeah, it's just bleach and developer and light, probably. I think it's just RA4 chemicals without, without the black box. Uh, all right. And then Tillman's, uh, you know, back to, to Lewis here a little bit. Uh, I was thinking about. Uh, you know, these certainly occupying a kind of painting space, but these are essentially, you know, the, the same type of uh, marks that, that sometimes seem to appear in, in Morris Lewis paintings, that there is a line, but there, it's, a, it's a line that's been bled. And these are certainly, you know, they feel like they're a product of light. You know, and I, I think that my... my uh, my, my thinking about, you know, additive versus subtractive in terms of color theory, not in terms of painting strategy, because, you know, people who have additive strategies as opposed to subtractive strategies kind of mean something different. I'm talking about the world of light, you know, the RGB world. We were in the Leslie Hewitt installation today, and, you know, when I moved my head from side to side quickly, I could see the RGB ghosts, and we were, like, in there doing that a little too long. Um, but uh, that you know that light is about the intangible. It's about the wor it's the world of the intangible. Not that it's the world of the ethereal or anything like that. But uh, that it's very much for me uh, connects to the idea of, of human seeing, uh, and, and not so much to uh, you know establishing a form. And then uh, this is a curveball. <laughs> But I remember reading something really profound about these in terms of uh, Roof's uh, intentions that uh, these are somewhat of a kind of rejection of, of a lot of um, 
ideas, traditional ideas around portraiture in that, uh, you know, the portrait has this ability to capture the inner soul of the person, and, and Ruff was basically, this is his middle finger to that notion that, you know, photography is ultimately about a kind of presentation of surfaces, uh, which I think, you know, from a subject matter standpoint is true, but I, again, there's a lot of, I think, paradoxical ideas here at play that, uh, you know, photography also has the ability to connect up to human sight, metaphorically, and and uh, human sight has the ability to connect to the dream world, you know, bringing, you know, hallucination. So there, there are these kind of uh, nodes that I, I feel like connect through association, but... Um, for me, the, these are these are about something much more uh, than than what they appear to be. I uh, but I, you know, I I can't really. I'm not sure what that might be. But uh, I think in person, one thing that happens just yeah. like phenomenologically is like because they're so big, you realize people's faces aren't symmetrical, and there's something really yeah. strange when you stare at them for a while, like mm. the irregularity of the human face. Yeah. I mean, as a surface, uh, the photograph comes through in a, in a totally uh, deranged way. You know, mm. but it's pretty slow. Deranged. You have to sort of forget you're looking at a face, and that happens sort of quickly because they're yeah. so big. Yeah, well, it's a topography, maybe. Right. It's sort of, yeah. Well, there, yeah, the, uh, there's an uncanny kind of quality, the scale. Uh, I think, you know, confronting uh, a portrait with such intense detail, it's kind of like standing very close to somebody. You maybe. also notice that the right side of her face is a little bit higher than the left side of her face? Like yeah. From the nose up? And I, they're totally like the way the flesh is rendered is remarkable. Yeah. And there are a lot of them are mounted to plexi too, and they, they have this softness, the bleed kind of quality. You're crushing the head. Should I do that? <laughs> Um, but curious, that's like, that's kind of what I have, I guess. I mean, yeah. I'm curious that's, what kind of surfaces we're dealing with here. Like we're we're dealing. You know. Well, this is this could get really deep and really cheesy if I'm not careful. I mean, I could it could seem very uh, cliche if I'm not careful. I I uh, uh, I mean, I, I think this is the world of appearances versus the world uh, of non-appearance. Mm -hmm. You know and. And uh, I, maybe this is like for me a, a grand metaphor too for what what this is what I'm ultimately maybe thinking about in terms of uh, you know the observable versus the uh, versus maybe what's what's possible or, or what's uh, what's not anchored concretely in uh, human observation, but but exists as another mm -hmm. kind of topography somewhere else, such as uh, in the dream world, maybe, or mm -hmm. or in hallucination, in, in the world of hallucination, which uh, is very hot. Um, it's like hot air blowing right on me. <laughs> oh, oh. Really nice. But um, yeah, maybe there's, uh, yeah, maybe that's all I can really say about that. I, I these I thought about these the least, but uh -huh. somehow I, I felt it was... Uh, well, there's like two kinds of surfaces. Like, there's one surface which is, like earlier we were saying, like surface, surface, surface can be shallow. Surface yeah. is shallow in that in both, uh, both um, physically and uh, conceptually it's shallow. There's, a, <laughs> there's that to it. And then this is a kind of different kind of a surface to it. it has a yeah, this is a total break, I think, yeah, from the... Break, this yeah. is totally... But I think somehow related in, in the sense that... Uh, well, I mean, it is the... this. These are the protagonists in this kind of um, scenario, as, as we are. I mean, the... Yeah, I... I, I don't know. Also I, kind of anomalies in his body of work, which... They are. But he did these for like, a long time. But, like... For your talk, it seems like you could have yeah. easily chosen work of his that related more obviously to what you're showing, but you <laughs> yeah. chose these, which I think is a critique. Yeah, I'm just like, kidding. Yeah, I mean, I well, I, I remember what he kind of adamantly, uh, how he adamantly explained these as, as being about uh, the limitations of photography. That, you know, somehow we, and I, I think that's uh, in a way linked back to maybe hokier prepackaged ideas of what photography can do and, and you know 
there are a lot of uh, photography programs that pride themselves on preparing students for, you know, a career in commercial photography, and and maybe that's you know, Flusur is talking about the program in, in that way that these these may be the critique that Roof was uh, proposing was, uh, you know, that photography does not have the ability that you know, it's kind of all uh, kind of manipulated affect that we experience when it comes to maybe showing someone's inner essence or, um, you know, she might have just had like bad gas right here or something, I don't, you know, um, that it's, it's not necessarily that she's, you know, that I, I think maybe the, as I'm thinking of this just right now that, you know, that appearances maybe aren't always what they appear. Um, yeah, maybe I shouldn't have just in, I shouldn't have included. Or that, like, what you just said, like she's caught up in the program of photography, not even as a photographer, but as a subject. As a subject, right? yeah, passport photo. I mean, a very. Doesn't use the word functionary. Yeah. yeah. But is the greater question? But Amazon owns this formula now, right? It's like yeah. you know, yeah. photographers yeah. mimicking painting, and painting, painters mimicking, mimicking photography. Yeah. Like, I feel like that's the greater. Yeah. The great, yeah, yeah. The greater question, or yeah. something Let's just get away from that right. one completely. <laughs> let's go back to a happier space. Let's let's yeah, linger like on. Let's yeah. linger on this. Yeah. That's I, interesting to me. <laughs> let's go let's get out of there. Um, I don't know. Well, that that's all I have, guys. Well, and I think your work mimic. I mean, not you're not mimicking anything. You're doing your own thing. But your photography is painting to me. I don't see you as a photographer. I see you as no. a painter, even though you're not painting anything. Thanks. I think that's kind of what I'm no, going I, for. I mean, that's uh, just yeah. I always your work. Yeah, but I, I, but I, uh, but I, yeah, I, I, I mean, still. Maybe not back in the 2005 era when I was a bucket rider, but yeah. you know, now I think it's. Yeah, but I, I like the idea that um, it is photography still somehow that it's expanding. The definition. I mean, in a, in a very trite way to say that, but uh, I, you know, for me, it's uh, I cannot get away from the lens image, and uh, whatever I, direction I go in, I, I enjoy abstraction. I, I enjoy thinking in non-representational spaces, and you know, it, it's 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 one vein of my work that's continued throughout all of my other concerns. It's it's always been kind of a parallel line that. Has existed alongside whatever else I was interested in, but you know, for me, at the end of the day, uh, it is it is about returning to uh, the the idea, anyway, of human observation, whether that is while you're awake or sleeping. Um, and I think that that's where kind of a hallucination comes in as a really intriguing idea, because uh, you can think you're experiencing something, and it can be completely, uh, you know not there. Right, because a hallucination is where you're seeing something and you're not entirely sure if it's real or not, or you're, it's uncanny in a way. Yeah. And so it's, yeah. you're sort of, you're having a, a tripping over perception of reality. Yeah. There. Yeah. Um, or, or you may not be in a position to be able to acknowledge that it is a hallucination. Right. Yeah. And bottom line to me, your work is inter interesting to me because it breaks the line between photography and painting. Yeah. Why do you find that interesting? I'm interesting. I because no one has. I mean, like that has been done, but mm -hmm. it just doesn't happen. Is it just a medium and a conversation about medium? Then? Well, not necessarily. Like it's a perception. It's mm -hmm. you know, you look at it. Is it a painting? Is it a photograph? You know, a photograph. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And that was the line. But in, and, in that, that that in and of itself is that interesting? Yes, I think so. Yeah. Because we're taught to look at them as totally different mediums. Mm -hmm. But what if they can be the same or blur that line? That we're taught that as mediums they have different burdens. They have to do with you. Correct. Yeah. I think that we're taught that as mediums they have different burdens. Burdens. The same yeah. as like Baggage, the, yeah. the conversation between photography and sculpture, or photography and painting, or anything else. It's not so much that they are so different in a way that's like fundamentally meaningful mm -hmm. for me, but that um, I feel like for the past five or ten years or whatever, people feel more able to engage with the conversations that are like historically attached you mm -hmm. know like the conversation about like 
photography and light and, and what that means as a registration of a kind of truth or the manipulations that are possible there. Like, and to your point, like of, Sterling Ruby, like, look, you know, he does, you know, sculpture and painting. So it's, hmm. you know, and what is what, you know. Yeah. Right, but it's a way of importing a kind of conversation wholesale right. and then being able to fuck around with it. Well, I think More than like a, there, there, there's also there's a, a sort of question I would think for um, thinking of photography and having a similar dialogue with painting back to um, Anton Bergaglia, futurist photographer that wrote Photo Diamonds in 1913. Um, it's a call for understanding light as a medium, mm -hmm. the way that painters understand to use paint, right? I mean, you specifically lays that out in this, you know, text where it's like, you know, you have to understand light as a fluid medium and understand how to manipulate it, use it, you know, either directly or indirectly through its John would say, would you say lens, the lens image? Yeah. Or is maybe, you know, you can think of it as uh, <clears throat> contingent, you know, upon an optomechanical device as opposed to an optomechanical uh, device or an optomechanical uh, aspect of photography. Um, Meaning, like, a, say, a photogram as opposed to a sure. lens image? Yeah, yeah. Uh, optomechanical, you know, it defines a, as a, a, a mechanical basis based on a very specific historical narrative uh, perspective, mm -hmm. perspective for a lot of Um, but I do think that the dialogue can and has gone back to, um, if it's there, it can be mined you know, back to um, Bergaglia's um, manifesto. I don't know how widely read that is, but um, on Yeah, on I didn't that. mean to suggest that it wasn't, that it had no precedent. I just meant, like, increasingly in the culture of, like, current art making practices, it's, it's, well, it's a prevalent kind sure. of Sure. Yeah. Yeah. You know, 1934, yeah. then Mal and I wrote uh, uh, an essay called uh, Production Reproduction. And there's two paths that we can go, about, go down at this point in photography. We can reproduce the world you know, with a camera device, or what does it mean to produce a world? And he's also started on this two page essay trying to lay out like, what would it mean to produce a world? Hmm. And I think historically we have gone down these sort of like reproduction, you know, mm -hmm. using the, um, the media. Mm -hmm. um, he doesn't offer a prescription. You know, to what it would be to produce a world, and it leads us to question like, what would it mean to produce a world? But I think that historically we've gone down the reproduction. Yeah. Even if someone makes something, an elaborate set, you know, that's crazy, and then photographs it, it's still re photographing, you know, the world. It's still mm -hmm. reproduction. Of the world. Whereas dealing with light is actually dealing with an entirely new configuration of how our eyes look at something. Can we bring Robert Hardy from in this conversation? I mean, I mean, what about the photograms that he did? Well, I mean, just like, like, amazing. So can yeah. you describe, does anyone know the work and can describe it? What it so, looks like? And it's so funny that we're here in this building talking about Robert Heineken because across the street, oh, yeah, literally, well, well the around, the, yeah. around the corner at 119 North Peoria, the guys at uh, New Catalog had all of his, they have all of his inventory. But now he has a show, you know, retrospective. No, not yeah. like what have you. Rona, you know, showed some of it. But they had his whole catalog of work for three years that no one knew oh, nor yeah. cared about. A lot, a lot longer than that, yes. That no one knew nor cared about. And yet now it's this huge thing. And like he yeah. just had this retrospective. It's amazing. I so saw it. They're photograms? Photograms. Yeah. I mean, I, he did yeah. a lot of the Polaroid series. He did different series. Yeah. So I, he did I, a photogram series, he did a Polaroid series. I'm sure you guys can talk more about yeah. it than I can, or better about it than I can. But. Yeah. I, I, I'm, uh, yeah. I mean, photography, I'm sorry. No, oh, I was going to say real quick. He is someone that, you know, I know Luke really well. Yeah, it, it's I've insane. I've looked at those for the last seven years, you know. I think to see some of the, like, yeah. you know, just... The point is, his work, light is the medium. If you look at feminist lingerie, it and it is, right? Is. Like he plays with like actually cutting out the fake shadows, right? And then when the piece is installed, and it actually the casts a real is. shadow. So light becomes is something mm -hmm. that becomes a medium, is something you know that can be talked about as a yeah. medium within his work as well, and not just as sort of like optical, you know, using um, uh, images that he didn't take. But he's playing with surface, he's playing with light, and both of those things as, as medium. And the most amazing photographs I've ever seen in my life. I find it cool. really important also that in this conversation there's two terms that have come up a lot, which are hallucination and illusion, and how this is used differently. Hallucination applying to photography and illusion applying to painting. Oh, illusion, I think. Not illusion. But no, I, I think when I said, I don't think anyone's used well, the word illusion. we were talking about the, the frame as a window or its relationship um, to painting. 
Yeah, I use the word, I mean, I was, maybe it's my Buffalo accent, but I, <laughs> elude, I think I used, but um, I, I didn't use illusion, maybe someone did. But well, anyway, the difference between those two terms and the, and the physicality of them. And that hallucination is something that you might not be able to differentiate. The illusion you can still experience while acknowledging is happening. I don't know. I think yeah, like okay, illusion, yeah. an illusion and a... Um, I don't see a big difference between illusion and illusion. Really? No. No, what is an allusion? Should we start from there? Well, when something alludes to something else, yeah. as though it, it points. Oh, it it's almost it alludes. It's yeah. Okay. In a in a <laughs> an illusion is something that points to something else, whereas in an illusion is a kind of yeah, just false. It alludes my own illusion. Or an illusion, yeah, false experience, or an experience that we might not necessarily uh, anchor in. In perception, necessary, or in, in a rational sense. Or in photography, a false yeah. pointing. Yeah, false, false pointing. pointing. What's a false pointing? An illusion. An illusion. An illusion. An illusion. A false pointing. Um, just to back up for one second, something that you and I were talking about earlier today, we were talking about um, the notion of um, an additive versus a subtractive uh, process, hmm. and we're not talking about. Um, in painting, like we're not talking about adding more material on a canvas or, or taking it away. We're talking about working with yeah. light as opposed to working with um, material objects, in a sense. Yeah. And so we were just looking at, we were sitting inside of uh, the East Genskin show, and we were looking at this projection on the wall, Amazing. and we were just looking at objects around. And um, it occurred to me that actually there is this like, very interesting difference between like trying to represent um, something with paint and then also trying to like represent light in in, yeah. in a way. And that, that just was just like a, a really crazy break of how to think, even think about medium specificity. Yeah, yeah, I think that's, um, yeah, and I, I think that's that's kind of what the equivalents are uh, alluding <laughs> to. Uh, that they, you know, in, in much the way that, um, you know, I was thinking about Lewis or, or Tillman's uh, abstraction that it feels like uh, the interplay of light, uh, which uh, you know a painter can paint light and shadow, sure, but mm-hmm. uh, in, in a way that it, it feels uh, captured, framed, not uh, not built up upon, not painted, I guess, not rendered necessarily. That yeah, that the, uh, the reason why Adam Henry's work is so arresting to me is because it. It, when I look at it, I feel as though I'm watching light mix and mm-hmm. not pigment. Mm-hmm. Right. And uh, and then I then I, I kind of go to a kind of alternative kind of hallucinatory uh, space. I, I do anyway. Mm-hmm. John, I have to yeah. say that I have not seen this show in person, but now I've seen this live. You're really doing some really great work here. I mean, Thank seriously, you. like. I'm, I'm excited that the next stuff will so not be blue. That's what I'm most excited about. <laughs> I love the lines, yeah. I mean, I like the lines are amazing. Yeah. Just um, saying. Thank you. As thank a fan. You. No, thank you. <laughs> Maybe that means a lot. I don't take compliments well. Have you been thinking about more service for a long time? Uh, yeah. You know, um, yeah, I, yes, I think so. I mean, not like every day, but uh, he's. You know, I. Yeah, you know, I, I think I think when I saw the Adam Henry show, too, I, I realized how much those paintings for me uh, were probably carrying photographic associations. You know, and I, you know, I, I've always looked at those as windows, not uh, not surfaces in which you know materials are interacting. I, yeah. What kind of question is that? Well, Lewis is well, amazing figure <laughs> too. Like, he works in like, a very tiny room. He, he yeah. destroyed like more than half of his output. Like as a mythological figure, he's fascinating. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. He's working for Closher every day. Yeah, he Yeah. And he was underwear. Yeah. Maybe that's, I don't know, because, you know, Robbie Brown has that picture. Oh, yeah. And then Sharon Lockhart has that series where she's, Sort of unpacking the making of the Morris Lewis. Yeah. But I just think well, it's I think interesting that, uh, that it's cachet. Like, well, the Rodney Grant photo, I feel like, is the dentist who owns the Morris Lewis. He's like, I can do this. Right. But he's like the guy who's interested in Morris Lewis as a, 
like an individual, right? As, as yeah, I think he, yeah, that's like the macho, you know, white macho machismo of the, the modernist project. I, I feel like that's the guy who would buy Morris Lewis if he felt like he couldn't make a Morris Lewis, but that guy felt like he could make the Morris Lewis, so, you know, I think. But you're like the guy who's making the Morris Lewis. I'm like the guy who can't make Morris Lewis, so I, I'd let Morris Lewis be more, do Morris Lewis. Um, anyway, I, anything else? Um, it's 6.30. Not to push this any further on this ceremony. Um, there was something else I wanted to say and I forgot. I think I, I want to hear a little bit more about shallowness. Yeah. If anyone has any interest in that. Yeah, I guess shallowness is I mean, how, how it deals with the surface. Or this. I mean, yeah. I guess I, I'm kind of interested in, in that too. You know, oh, one of the things that yeah, Adam Henry said to me was if you want to know about the person or their intentions, look at the surface. And I said, can I quote you on that? And he's like, yeah, sure, why not? <laughs> uh, so what do you mean? What do you mean by that? Well, it was in, in critique to, well, his, I mean, I didn't write, I, I can't quote him verbatim, so please don't, don't email Adam know. Henry. But I, I think what he was suggesting was that there are a few camps in painting that are operating today and in one seems to be very much about just an indulgence in surface as maybe a vehicle for, uh, you know, selling and ultimately kind of more of a social engagement, a social idea than I think other types of painting which maybe are so I think what he was suggesting was that surface might be the alter, the alternate site for say branding or social right. uh, interaction I mean Josh Abelow comes to mind I mean I you know I I love his paintings I think he's a great painter you know and, and when you look at those paintings I think you know that he knows how to paint he knows what's up um, and he's, he's playing with those those notions of the, the amateur and the master. That's one of the things he's dealing with. But that those paintings aren't really urgently calling us to to stand in front of them alone, for instance. Where I, I think what uh, you know, I think Adams, you know, is is looking for a much lonelier kind of melancholy pursuit of you know of looking at those paintings in, a, in another way. That, that, that kind of, uh, you know, establishment of space uh, kind of send, sends the projects off into two very different realms. And I, I'm paraphrasing what our conversation was about, but um, which I, I think is, uh, is interesting. I, I think there are some legs there. I'm not sure where they go, but... Uh, is this your next tattoo? No, man. I don't, I don't do tattoos. I'll sell this to someone for $500. Can I throw out one more thing? For a tattoo. Uh, self-aware, like surface is self-aware. Yeah. Like we we Self had like a brief yeah. conversation about like these images that are made to be photographed and to be circulated and to look good on an LED screen and Ooh. like the fact that they are, yeah, they're, they're, they're made, they're almost made um, like to look a uh, to look like a surface that is, I mean, it is a, it's a superficial way of making, spreading around images that has become very, um, uh, I don't know, rote in a way or. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, uh, people know what they're doing. Like there's a, maybe, well, I guess what, what is, you know, what is ultimately, uh, the end game, you know, for, uh, a kind of, you know, uh, overemphasis of, of purely just surface, I guess. I mean, what what is, uh, and I, I guess that's whether, what your definition of transcendence is, maybe, and, and whether you think a work of art should contain that kind of uh, movement or that, that kind of feeling or affect. You know, what, whether, I guess, you know, what, what are you looking for in a, in a, in a work of art, I guess? 
if there was like a, a only example that you showed, there was an example that sort of was the closest thing to pure surface. Well, I don't. I don't think there's anything like that. I mean, I. I think Tony's paintings at Cobby's right now, um, you know, but they're not about surface. I mean, I, uh, those are very much about surface for me. I mean, they're kind of jokes, you know, they're joke paintings for yeah. me. But uh, what, what's, what they're suggesting is like kind of really dark and like probably Adam more having, disturbing. Maybe than, what the Adam Hattie thing is, what, maybe what he's suggesting is that, you know, like looking at the surface of the painter will tell you what the painter is about is not, like, is saying that surface is something, it's a way to access, it's a way to access, not access, access. Um, access, access. Maybe. <laughs> uh, but it's a way to sort of, like, to generate some idea of what, of what they you know, what the artist is trying to frame their work, and maybe they're trying to frame their work in terms of painting's relationship to photography, or painting's relationship to sculpture, or, right? Like, so... Yeah, I, I, I can think of a painter. Not John Pistoni, but who's the, the the woman who's from LA and shows with Shane? Alex Smith. Alex Smith. Alex Smith, is that Alex? Yeah. There's a couple LA girls. No, no, that's this painter, Alex, Alex, somebody or other. Alex. And Alex Olson. Alex Olson, yeah. There's a painter. I mean, but uh, surface in the sense where when I look at her paintings, I start to think about much what I think about when I look at Adam, how they were made. You know, and so that, that's about a layering of time, I guess. So, yeah, I, mean, I still think you can sort of access. I mean, you're paying. Access. Are you trying service. to get me to talk about this? No, not at all. I mean, I'm trying because to figure out. Because you're plastic painting. Introduce yourself. I'm trying to figure out how I fit into this conversation. Oh, for this. I yeah. don't think surface is something that's like. Zach this. Buckner, Chicago. I don't think here is like a. I don't think you can talk about surface as just surface, right? We haven't. I mean, like, we've been talking about surface for an hour and a half yep. or longer than that. And. You know, we've barely even said the word. You know, we've talked about material, yeah. we've talked about image, we've talked about photography a lot. Yeah. We haven't really talked about. Yeah, like, I need like three hours. Or yeah, three I'm just thinking that, like, I don't. So when I ask, like, is there anything, if there's anything in your example that are closest to sort of just talking about pure surface or surface as like its own. No. Because I, I think in a way that's uh, not. Uh, you know, move, strip away the other stuff and just talk about. Well, what, what do you mean maybe by pure surface? I don't know. I'm just wondering if that's possible. Well, let me, yeah. yeah it's I, more like a question. Well, I think it is. about pure surface. Well, this isn't, you know, we're not talking about minimalist sculpture. You know, I, I for me, what I'm, I'm trying to, I guess, in my mind, draw a connection to is, uh, you know, what, what Krauss referred, Rosalind Krauss refers to as transparency in photography, that uh, when you look at a photograph, part of you allows yourself to believe in the fantasy of, of looking through a window, even no matter how self-conscious you are about that phenomenon existing and, and where that intersects with painting, not in a Renaissance way, but in a postmodern way, I guess. So, I mean, surface, uh, I guess that's, those aren't the questions. I, I don't, I, yeah. This is like a well, there are a couple par different surfaces, like we yeah. talked about, like there's the, the Krauss, the, the looking through the window, there's this sort of notion of surface as a point of transparency where things are dipping up and, and going in and out of this, there's, then there's, the, the, we were talking about holograms for a few minutes today, <laughs> yeah. we were talking about painting on the reverse of canvases so that the paint seep, seeps through the, the edge, um, mm -hmm. we're talking about thinking about it photographically and then also as a, as a flat. So there's like, yeah. literally there's only like a number of, of options. That, I would actually say that that's a, that's a matter of perspective, right? I mean, one can look at a photograph that's that printed F64 club, you know, a great depth of field, you know, like, holy shit, is this a you know, window to the world, right? Mm -hmm. But if you look at it in the perspective of like, wait a minute, this is just nothing but an illusion, right? Mm -hmm. This is just flat surface. Right? Mm -hmm. And so it's speaking about that. Mm -hmm. Or if you remove the optomechanical device and you make something that's purely abstract, it's like, oh, well, this is about the surface. Or is it not? It's about, about play of light and objects and, you know, one's hand moving and manipulating light. These, you could make the same arguments with painting as well. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't know who you would point to and be like, this is just about surface. Which I actually think is a good question, but it's a question that answers itself. Well, how about the in, Jacob Kessay? I, I would say would be... Jacob Kessay. Oh my god, I'm in love. 
Is that what you said, Jacob Kassay? Yeah, with Jacob Kassay, or the what fact that I said Jacob <laughs> Well, we have, we have a friend who says that those are mirrors, mirrors for rich people. But, um, what, what's for rich people? Do you say mirrors. 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 Jacob Kassay painting, mirrors for rich people. Okay. I mean, I, uh, I mean there, there's an alchemical kind of way in which those came into the world, I think, which is a kind of depth. But I, I would say ultimately those are paintings that are very much about activation of the surface. Just trying to please you right now. I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> just because he uses silver doesn't mean it's mirrors for rich people. I just want to use the phrase mirrors yeah. for rich people. Like we can also well, talk about surface in terms of sort of like, you know, we talk about that's surface space and depth. We talked about it in terms of conceptually, like whether or not you know, you made the joke about the radical places of being sort of shallow space, shallow concept, and whether yeah. or not, you know, like for me, his ex he might be the closest example of something that's pure surface because it feels like there's not a lot of depth, so I'm involved in sort of looking at only a shallow amount of space, but it would also see like there's not a lot of depth sort of conceptually, so I'm seeing a sort of surface design, yeah. formal, shallow, conceptual moment. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's my read on it. So like in a way he might be the one that sort of encompasses the most possible reads of surface mm -hmm. and in the most general Light, way. Light street. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And maybe yeah. maybe shallowness is interesting. Like maybe that's an interesting I think shallowness yeah. is super interesting. <laughs> yeah. But and so it, like, is yeah. that but I mean I don't know I guess. Yeah, I'm not saying there's one one right or I mean wrong way. Yeah. Well, no, I wasn't suggesting that. I was just wondering if you could, if, if there was a way. I was asking. If That's why I'm doing way. this because I don't know. I, I mean, know. I, I was. Just, I was trying to. I mean, help I don't know what I'm saying here. I mean, that's kind well, of, I'm well, trying to figure this out. Well, now yeah. that we've uh, now that we've started the conversation. <laughs> No, we have to end it, unfortunately, because we are eating into the next. That's uh, okay, but that's, I mean. Time. You know what? We I feel like we're. No, no, I'm, and like, that's what. what I mean, this is a, a fabulous conversation that I would love to see more of, and I think that's oh, why we're doing this. Emotionally we'll exhausting. All, like, <laughs> emotionally exhausting. I find it fascinating. Does anyone else? I, I, yes. No. No one does. No. Well, I, mean, I, don't, I don't know if anyone's interested in staying for the next one, but let's just take five. And John, yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What? Thank you so much. Okay, yeah. yeah. No, I had a good time. This is good. Yeah, yeah, let's get around. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, everybody. Elliot. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, uh, 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 hey,